Welcome to part two of the Blue Ocean Strategy. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about more of some of the organizational hurdles to getting the Blue Ocean Strategy implemented and to change the company culture and to move forward with reorganizing a company uh, into a more of a Blue Ocean Strategy modality. Now, in chapter seven, we talk about an organizational hurdles that can hinder an organization's move towards a Blue Ocean Strategy. And there are four main hurdles, cognitive, resource, motivational, and political. So we're going to talk about each of these in detail. Now, sometimes there's what we call a tipping point in leadership. And this is where a situation occurs where a critical mass, a critical mass develops and there's a real need or understanding for a change or a movement towards an idea. Um, so there's an, sort of a epidemic in this, this movement and this concentration that's hard to be diffused. Um, so it's a time where there are stresses on the business, there are stresses um, between the shareholders, the stakeholders, the employees, the customers, and influence is pushing the company to make a change. And the leadership, either they uh, recognize the need for this change, accept it, and move forward, or they'll be replaced. And there are four particular hurdles that can help influence the situation. And the first hurdle is a cognitive hurdle. Um, it's getting your employees and stakeholders to understand the need for change. It's not just a numbers game. It's a feeling. It's something you see every day. Um, there's a change in the thinking of the employees and the leadership of the company. Once that hurdle can be made, cognitively they can understand a change needs to be made, and people see this problem clearly, uh, and this shifts their mindset into a way they're facing reality and realize a change has to be made. So once that cognitive, because people, when they work for a business, you get sometimes locked into a way of thinking. You get a closed mind and you do the same things you, you always do. And you never really, you, at a certain point you get closed off. And it's easy to fall into this trap. So the cognitive hurdle is breaking through everyone's mindset and re, reshifting them to a new reality where they're in a place that they can understand the need for change and the need for a new bold strategy. And better leaders, um, a better leader is someone who's able to do this more consistently. They have a method or a modality of communicating and changing minds and rallying the, the employees and stakeholders to, to the face of the new reality of having to make bold changes in the corporate and product structure to maintain competitiveness. Now a resource hurdle, there are three levers. One are hotspots, activities that have low resource input but high performance impact. Two, cold spots, activities that have high resource inputs but low performance impact. And horse trading, trading your uh, excessive resources for another unit's excessive resources that you might need. Uh, so these are really resources are what sometimes holds a company back from being able to make this change and redirecting their resources from cold spots to hot spots, you know, um, sort of balancing out what you have to work with, um, trying to make, trying to spend your resources the best possible. You know, sort of like a marketing campaign, advertising campaign. You have limited dollars, but you wanna, uh, you wanna get the most bang for your buck, and you wanna realign to have a big footprint. So you have to forget, in, in the resource hurdle, there are limited resources. Sometimes it's capital, which is money. Sometimes it's personnel uh, and what they know and their training and learning. Sometimes it's industry standards. But recognizing the resource limitations and redesigning the corporation to maximize the resources they do have or finding ways to minimize, minimize the need for resources or maximize their ability to achieve resources or gain resources is critical to moving forward. Motivational hurdle. So motivation 
remember, an organization must motivate the employees, and that's a difficult thing. So leaders are critical to this effort to really motivate employees to want to um, go along with this change in the organization. So when a tipping point occurs and, and they realize a change has to be made, there's three factors of disproportionate influence that may occur. And these can prevent, sometimes prevent you from achieving your goal. So for any strategy to be successful, there has to be a way to convey motivation to the people who are gonna be doing the work. If they're not on board with doing the work that's required to implement this new strategy, it's going to fail. And think about this in your own work life. There, were there things where the management came down with new ideas or new programs and the general consensus of the company was, this isn't gonna work or I don't like this or I'm gonna resist it, I'm not gonna do as little as possible and not really work together as a team. Well, sometimes you have what are called kingpins, and these are, um, and you, these are focused on key individuals within the organization. So there's certain people who um, you want to get all these different people on board. Maybe the management of the company, maybe this key influential people in different areas. If you can get these kingpins on board, and, and these are the people who, who are e most easily able to influence the rest of the organization, you'll have an easier time sur surmounting this motivational hurdle. There's also the fishbowl management. So you get all the kingpins together for a regular review of their results, place pressure on key influencers to perform, uh, also leverages experiences of managers by promoting open communication of experiences, uh, and leverage experiences of managers by prompting open communication and experiences. Um, now why do they call this the fishbowl management? Because it's a very transparent process and transparency is to make people want to just to people feel like they know what's going on and to help people be motivated by witnessing what the influence impact of the managers are having and the pro performance criteria that you're placing on these managers are visible to all so they they have a fair understanding of what the management's trying to do and that we'll get to that later why fair is important but the fishbowl management is really just you know letting everybody see um, how their motivation, uh, letting everyone see how your course of actions are gonna reward people for making the right choices and being on board and how this change is gonna affect the company for the better and how that can improve your life as a manager or employee. So the fishbowl management is a way of doing these things and getting everybody to witness them so they wanna participate as well. Atomization, breaking the goals down into achievable pieces that, that's not going to overwhelm the players. So this is a way of, sometimes change is just too much and, and too mounting and a lot of people want to give up at the thought of everything they have to do to complete uh, this new strategy. So being able, it's critical to be able to break it down to bite-sized chunks, achievable chunks that will appear, that will appear out of reach making it into stages or levels or, or steps in a way that um, employees can feel comfortable in understanding that, okay, I can do this. It, the whole process may seem overwhelming, but they're, they're really only expecting me to do this part of it right now. I can achieve that. And that's an important way of keeping people motivated because nothing kills motivation like the fear of not being able to complete a task because it's so large, it's so big, why even try? Okay, so conventional wisdom uh, versus tipping point leadership. So conventional wisdom is that massive employees um, rest on this mass to make a transformation. So change efforts are focused on moving the mass and requiring uh, steep resources in a long time frame. But the tipping point leadership looks at the extremes. And to change the mass, we want to focus on the extremes. The people who really are the leaders and the people the employees look up to and follow and their activities and, and exercises that they do have a disproportionate influence on achieving a strategic shift in the company. So instead of trying to win over the masses in the conventional wisdom, you, try, you just have to focus on a few key people, which is a lot easier to change a few key people's minds and get them on board and motivate them, incentivize them, uh, and then everybody else will follow. Uh, so this tipping point leadership, and a lot of research that was done in looking at employees, 
employees are really like lemmings or ants. They want they want so they want leadership to follow. They want to they want someone to blaze a path for them. So they look to a, a couple of key individuals in the corporation that really set the tone and really lead the organization. So identifying these extremes in the company and getting them on board is sort of what we're what the book is trying to explain about the tipping point leadership and why it's important. Okay, there could also be a political hurdle. So there could be what we call leveraged angels, those who have the most to gain from change. So in the, in the politics, you can think of politics, every company has their own interior politics, and of course there's the exterior politics as well. But leverage angels, these are people who have the most to gain from the change. So they're really on your side. Now, the silence devils, those who have the most to lose from change. So you want to isolate the devils, um, build the strength in the angels, and try to cut off any arguments that the devils may have. So trying to isolate the devils, give them as little power as possible, um, and in being giving the angels the resources to be able to defend themselves against the devils and prepare for their naysaying in the future. Now, the devils are basically, there's a lot of people that are just negative. So devils are really negative people who, when you try to make a change, they come up with the reasons for why it's not going to work. When you come up with an idea, let's do this, let's go to the beach. Oh, I don't want to go to the beach. I don't like sand in my bathing suit. I don't, I'm going to get sunburn. Uh, it's going to be crowded. Uh, the water's going to be cold. Uh, all these reasons why not to do something. And they're missing out on what you know is going to be a really fun time uh, and a really valuable and rewarding time. So a lot, anytime you deal with change, you're going to have these negative devils who are really going to try to um, persuade or stop change from happening. And most of the times they do this because they're afraid, they have a lot to lose, or they're just afraid of change because change means work and change means uncertainty. Uh, now, trying to find a insider who knows the problems, knows the devils, um, who will fight for your change of ideas and support the new strategy. This is key. This is sort of looking for those extreme players again. These are the people who are going to really be able to navigate the organization because each organization has a different culture. So you're not going to be able to successfully implement a new strategy without being able to navigate the uh, complexity of the organization. Okay. So let's think about motiv motivating for change. So we want, it, this is critical because if people aren't on board with this change and they don't view the value of it, why would they want to work on it? So getting people in the organization to do what is needed to make a successful strategy is difficult. So people in the organization, they have to embrace the idea, the belief of the new strategy, almost so it was like a religion. And they have to be willing to go beyond the, um, their, their ordinary duties and really go beyond the execution and volunteer and cooperate enthusiastically and not be negative about things or the change or, or you know, constantly talk about rumors or, or negativities. People who are really on board, almost excite, as excited as if it was their own business they were building. And that's really key. If you can get employees to think more entrepreneurial and uh, get employees to see how they, they are going to win in this change and how they are going to get personal benefits from this uh, strategy succeeding, that's a good way to motivate them. Um, and you want employees to value the strategy and want to implement it. So one way to be successful is uh, management must be honest. Otherwise employees, they're not going to believe that the changes are going to be valuable. Uh, they may fight against them or work to eliminate them if the change is going to cause them more work or more um, more grief if they don't really understand the value or how it's going to bring them any benefits. So the process has to be very fair. So if you people care or can be more invested when they feel the process is fair, that the input and the work they put into the process, they'll be recognized and rewarded, and that helps them to want the results to be positive. Now, uh, the fair process affects people's attitudes, and we have the strategy formulation process, so we want employees to see that it's a fair process of engagement, where the employees get to work with it. There's an explanation, they understand they're going to be, you know, a fair and consistent 
<clears throat> and the thing is, consistency is key. You can't say one thing one day and say another thing another day. The message has to be on point. It has to be explained in a way that um, gains them clarity in what the new strategy is and what the process is going to be to achieve it and their role within it. Uh, attitudes, trust and commitment. Employees have to feel like their opinion, their input, their work matters and counts. And they have to have the trust that if they go out on a limb and develop these things, cooperate, that they're going to be rewarded and protected. Now behavior, voluntary cooperation. This is, when we say go beyond the call of duty, this means, you know, you're doing things, helping other employees, taking, you know, taking a chance. Uh, stopping your work for a minute to help somebody else with a problem, really cooperating fully beyond what the scope of your job is, going above and beyond um, what you're expected to do to really help this process move forward. And the strategy execution is exceeding expectations. People are just all working at the level as if it was their own business, you know, taking care of their work and their involvement in the company as, as if they had a personal stake. And that's key that manager, management communicates that there, there's a personal stake in this moving forward for the employees. So three principles of fairness, the three E principles of fairness are the fair process. One, engagement. Involving the employees of the company in their strategic decision making that affects them. Asking them for inputs, showing them that um, the inputs are valued, and when they make sense, the strategic decisions are modified to incorporate them. You know, allowing them to argue where things don't make sense, and treating their ideas and their um, points with integrity, and trying to, your best to having open mind, so employees really see that there's a fair engagement. Explanation: Everyone involved needs to fully understand what this new strategy is, why it's important, and what they have to gain by it. Um, so this need, you need to describe the path, the overall strategy, the path to get there, the options that employees would have working with, within the new strategy. Um, and they acknowledge that the explanation that the strategy is, part of the strategy is being open to employees' view and considering their inputs, their contributions, and rewarding them properly. Now, expectation clarity, like I talked about before, um, managers have to clearly state what the new rules are, the new rewards, the new paradigm. Um, no matter how demanding the employee, the, this can be, the communication has to be clear in order for people to feel that there's a fair process going on. So collectively, all three of these criteria uh, lead to judgments about the fair process. So if employees don't feel like they're engaged in the process, that they're, they're being that there's an explanation of why it's necessary, and that there's a clarity reached, they're not going to view it as a fair process. So why does this matter? Well, when individuals recognize that their input and their intellectual worth uh, is valued, they're inspired to impress others and share their knowledge. When they feel comfortable, they're going to come forward. If you feel like your idea is going to be stolen from you and you're going to not going to get any credit or that your idea is just going to be trampled on just because it's your idea, you clam up. You don't want to add to anything. You want to avoid this. A, fair, a fairness environment helps that. Number two, individuals are recognized as important and they, there's an emotional tie or commitment uh, to the strategy that makes them go above and beyond what's required of them. So they feel a real sense of uh, commitment and accomplishment and pride in working on this new strategy and getting it done. So if there's a violation of the fair process, on the other hand, then ideas will not get shared. People will, you know, people will begin, will begin to devalue other people's ideas. You know, if you don't respect what I'm saying, I'm going to shit all over what you're saying. And people will get angry, and they're going to drag their feet. They're, they're going to, you know, not really put their full effort behind it because, in a certain point, they may hope that it fails. To say, see, your ideas stink. The whole thing failed. You know, and that's a negativity you don't want to bring up. If people start to feel shut out and feel like their opinion doesn't matter, why would they help the company or your idea succeed? They're going to work for your ideas to fail so they can point at you and say, see, you should have listened to me. Okay. So these are two paths. The fair path or process where there's an intellectual and emotional recognition of the employee's value, a trust and knowledge and sharing 
environment is develops out of this and then voluntary cooperation uh, is gained from the employees in this in implementing and achieving the strategy in an unfair process there's an intellectual um, in, in, in a, and an emotional indignation where people's intellectual values or inputs are not looked on favorably and their emotional needs are not considered. So a lot of times when you have top management or certain management that are trying to really foster their ideas or protect their identity or they, they're afraid of an employee having a better idea than thus making them look bad, they create this intellectual and emotional indignation that employees are going to clam up and not really help. Um, then that leads to the distrust and resentment that employees have for their managers if their, you know, if their ideas, the managers are going to force their ideas down their throats and they're not going to listen to their experiences in, on the manufacturing floor, on the service floor, and, the, and you know, in many different areas in the company. If they're not going to listen to their years of experience of why something may be a problem or they have a better way of doing it, then, you know, things aren't going to work out. You're going to get non-cooperation in the strategy. And those are the two paths. So you have the fair path where you really value people's inputs, you're clear, there's a transparency, there's a commitment and a trust with the employees, or you have the unfair process. And believe me, I've worked in a lot of companies, and most of the time, I see the unfair process at work every day. And that's why you may feel that a lot of companies you work at are dysfunctional, or you're just surprised that this company can do business at all, given their unfair process, where things are hidden, and, and people's you know compensations are hidden, uh, certain people are respected and other people are not respected. These, you know, this unfair environment is m more often the norm and that's why it's really difficult and takes a lot of bold leadership to really focus on the fair process of and creating an environment. Okay, focus on sustainability. There are some barriers to imitation of blue ocean strategy. So when you have a good blue ocean strategy, um, there's some things that may keep the competitors at bay. One could be um, the value innovation doesn't make sense to the competitor's logic. So your value innovation is something that they can't really see as valuable. Take Dyson vacuum cleaners. When Dyson came out with their bagless vacuum cleaner, that was a real value to customers. But the competition, Hoover's, who was actually offered to, you know, a Hoover, um, Dyson offered to sell Hoover's their technology and they refused and later said that they should have bought that technology and buried it. They just didn't see the logic, the logic in a vacuumless bag because they made so much money selling vacuum bags. Just like printer companies make so much sell money selling ink. And if someone develops an inkless um, printer, then there will probably be a blue ocean right there created. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, okay. Two, blue ocean strategy conflicts with the competitor's brand image. If something you're doing a new way of designing the product, a new modality of what you're focusing on goes against generations of brand building or what your company is against, then that conflict with your brand image is really something that the, the competitors are not going to want to overtake. So if your brand image is high quality and um, exclusive, expensive uh, types of uh, products, you may not want to try and compete on a lower cost, more innovative type of solution. All right. uh, natural monopoly, if there's a monopoly in, in place, that really, if you're the company that has a blue ocean and that develops into monopoly, then you're gonna have a market dominance. So it's gonna be very hard for someone to imitate your blue ocean products if you have a natural monopoly. Something like a regional, um, your regional monopoly in place by, uh, by um, the government, or, or just or somehow something been developed to give you a monopoly on something is going to be a really strong position. One of those things could be patent of the legal protection. So if your blue ocean innovation has patent of the legal protections, it's going to keep you um, your blue ocean uh, protect your blue ocean for longer. Although I mean Dyson had patents and legal protection on their vacuumless cyclone technology but didn't stop dozens for companies, dozens of companies finding a way around it and creating their versions of the product. Um, high volume leads to rapid cost advantages. So if you have a blue ocean advantage and that leads to you having higher volumes at first, you can tr turn that into cost advantages um, by um, economies of scale and that can help maintain your blue ocean strategy. Network externalities. Uh, and this is where you develop a network 
where everybody's on your network. So it'd be very difficult for a competitor to come in and, and steal your blue ocean because, uh, for example, when Microsoft has everybody on the Windows PC operating system, it was very difficult for Apple to break that network externality. Uh, political operation and cultural changes, not always possible. You know, so that's, you know, in certain companies, if, if the political, operational, and cultural changes that we talked about earlier are not possible, they may not be able to compete in the blue ocean against your products. Um, a brand buzz and loyal customer base from value innovation. So if you create a real buzz about how innovative your products are and you create a loyal customer base from the value your product generates, then that's going to be difficult for anybody to, to come up and um, destroy your blue ocean. And that could be seen something in Apple. The, uh, the Apple customer loyal base, uh, they have a base that's so strong. Some of them buy every time a new phone is released, they buy a new phone. They buy the new MacBook. They buy the whole family of Apple products. It's just the customer base is so value Apple's innovation that it's hard for anybody else to compete against it. Okay, uh, Red Ocean traps. Let's talk about some traps of the Red Ocean that can help, that can you know, prevent you from creating a blue ocean. Some of these traps can be the mind or the thinking of the management involved, but number one, the, the belief that blue ocean strategy is customer-oriented strategy that's about being customer-led. And this is a fallacy. It's not just about, um, this is basically saying that it's a strategy of doing what the customer wants and creating a product the customer wants. Well, it's only part of it. Sometimes you're creating a product that the customer doesn't know they want, but they're gonna want once they see it. So sometimes with, with the mistake here is that it's not just about, a lot of times what the customers may say they want something, but in reality, they don't want it. Um, customers may want a bigger size. They may want a, a, a good selection of colors. They may want, you know, um, you know, a lot of things the customers may say they want, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna sell. And you take someone like you know Steve Jobs to, to figure out what the customer wants before the customer even can can even knows about it, and that's what gives you a real blue ocean. So it's not necessarily what the, everything the customer says; it's thinking almost for the customer and developing a, developing a product they didn't even know they wanted. That once they see it, they clearly you know are going to uh, flock to it. And this is what separates you from everybody else that just run around and keep trying to do what the customer wants. So if you made if you made a product that does you know everything the customer wants. So if you're in the say in the Zoom simulation and you're meeting or exceeding all the customer expectations in the product, there's no profits for you. And and if you have to price the product too high to put in all those features for the customer, they're not going to want it. So that's an example right there. Number two, the belief that to create blue oceans you must venture beyond the core business. This is not true. You can create blue oceans with all your core business products. You don't have to develop a new product to be in a blue ocean. And you don't have to go beyond your core business. You can stay within your core business and develop your blue ocean products. Uh, the misconception that blue ocean strategy is about new technologies. It's not always about new technology. Sometimes new technologies like with the Apple, I'm not sorry, the Nintendo Wii, uh, the, motion, the motion control helps or virtual reality that's coming up will help. But that doesn't necessarily, is not a requirement of a blue ocean. Sometimes a blue ocean is taking existing technologies and applying them in a better way. Uh, four, a belief that to create a blue ocean you must, must be first to market. Absolutely untrue. A lot of people are first to market, but they're first to market with a product that's not perfected or not that good. A blue ocean is really like an example of yellow tail wine. A blue ocean can be a product coming late to market, but just having a better way of coming to market or a better product that's going to really satisfy the customer more. Five, the misconception that the blue ocean strategy and differentiation strategy are synonymous. It's not true. The blue ocean strategy isn't about differentiation. Uh, in fact, the blue ocean strategy is usually about making a product that the masses are going to really like. Although there could be a differentiation strategy or a niche strategy, it's not always the case. So don't pigeonhole blue ocean strategy into a differentiation strategy by itself. The, mis the misconception of the blue ocean strategy is a low cost strategy that focuses on low pricing. This is not true. Although we do focus on cost and profit, value and profit, we don't necessarily only focus on low cost. Low cost is important 
and low pricing can be important in some strategies, but what we're focusing on is value. So the Blue Ocean strategy is looking to create a value that exceeds the cost of the product. So if you can get something that's so valuable, the cost of it, you can price it at a price point where the costing will leave, at, the, at a cost level to leave the company profitable, what it's all about. So it's really about creating value and creating a price that's going to produce profits, but you don't have to be low priced and low costs. You just have to be high value, and that's the difference. Seven, the belief that Blue Ocean strategy is the same as innovation. It's not the same. Innovation is developing something new. Uh, and a lot of times what you develop, what, what is new, fails, or there's no market for and no demand. Blue Ocean is really the creating value. You could use innovation to create that value, or you could just use a reorganization of the standard materials and ideas to create value. So it's not just about innovation. Innovation can be part of it, but it's not the same as innovation. It's more about value, creating value for customers uh, so they can see the value of your product and be willing to buy it and, and choose your product over the competition. Eight, the belief that Blue Ocean strategy is a theory of marketing and a niche strategy. So marketing is important, but Blue Ocean really isn't about marketing. It's about uh, creating a valuable product that consumers will like. Marketing is a way of getting that message out, but we're not trying to do marketing tricks. We're not trying to trick people into buying the product based on marketing or trick people into perceiving a value that isn't there because they may buy the product once, but they won't buy it again if the value truly isn't there. And it's not necessarily a niche strategy. We're looking for a small subgroup of people for a feature that's going to really appeal to them. It's quite the opposite. We're looking for a larger catchment. We're looking for a larger group of people to make the product have a wider base of accepting, acceptance. Nine, the belief that the Blue Ocean strategy sees competition as bad, when in fact it can be good for companies. Blue Ocean strategy only works because there is competition. And what you're trying to do is make your competition irrelevant. It's not saying eliminate your competition. Competition is good for, for the fact that it drives companies forward, keeps them in, innovative. The Blue Ocean is just saying because there is so much competition, you need to innovate uh, and create value, mostly create value. So, you, so it's not, they don't view competition as bad. They view competition as something that you have to overcome and you have to make irrelevant but not disappear. Uh, the belief that Blue Ocean strategy is synonymous with creative uh, destruction or disruption. Um, the Blue Ocean strategy isn't about um, disruptive innovation or disruptive technologies, and that's where something comes out that obsoletes another product. Sometimes it happens in Blue Ocean, but it's not really um, 100% of the time. Sometimes the Blue Ocean product can be something that really does disrupt an industry in a way that the MP, MP3 disrupted the CD and music industry. Um, the Blue Ocean strategy is about using the tools that are available to create value. And sometimes that value can really disrupt an industry, but it's not really what happened. It's not what happens 100% of the time with Blue Ocean. You're not looking to disrupt or destroy an industry. You're looking to preserve an industry and capture most of the customers in the industry by making a product that has higher value uh, that customers are going to want to buy above everything else. Let's look at, let's take a, a, a break to talk about an example of Blue Ocean strategy, uh, something that we can start in the early 1900s and talk about the movie theater industry. So the movie theater industry started out, you can kind of think of it starting out with Nickelodeons. And these are these machines you look, you kind of, you look into and you crank, turn this crank on the machine and it flips these pictures and makes a little moving story. So that was really the first video um, entertainment people have. You put a couple of nickels in and you turn and you get a little couple minute story through these flickering images. Now, at a certain point, that was a very crude, sophomoric, and, and, sh and had a shorter time duration of the Nickelodeons. And they would actually have Nickelodeon arcades where you could go in and watch all these little short films. Later on, the palace theaters were developed. And this was moving the, changing the location into a big grand theater. Chandeliers, um, comfortable seats, um, big, you know, uh, expensive carpets and marble, really making an event night out where people would come and see a more full, full feature length movie. 
So that was the, um, these palace theaters were one screens, one screen, and they really catered to um, starting with the silent pictures and into the black and whites and finally color pictures. These palace theaters were just single screen movie theaters that were to create an experience or a night out for people. And that worked for a long time. But then it, it stopped working and it stopped growing. And the introduction of television is one of the things that um, reduced the need for the palace theaters. Then the introduction of VCRs and being able to rent movies at home, something had to change. And then, thus the multiplex was created. And the idea of the multiplex was let's have more movies in one location, uh, create more of a designation and uh, um, appeal to a wider audience, a higher catchment of people. So the Palace Theater showed one movie at a time. So if you didn't like the movie in your town, you'd have to travel, travel farther away to see a different movie. So the multiplex came out and put you know, 10 movies in one theater at once, and also was able to have different size screens. So that way, um, new movies would start out in the bigger auditoriums, the bigger screens, and as those movies were getting older and there's less attendance, they could move them to smaller um, theaters and, and make room for newer movies in the bigger theaters. So they had a better rotation of films. Can you imagine having, now when you are going to commit to a film in a movie theater, sometimes you have to commit to it to six to eight weeks. So if you pick the wrong film and you have a one screen movie theater, you've just destroyed your business over the next six to eight weeks. So if it's in the, it's, it's the 70s and you didn't pick Star Wars or Jaws that summer to be the one film on your screen, you were really losing money uh, on your single screen. The multiplex solved that. So you allowed the theater owners to make a mistake, sometimes uh, book the wrong movie, but also book the right movie at the same time. So if the wrong movie with low attendance can be put in a smaller theater, and then the bigger movies that are getting more attendance can be screened in the bigger theater. Uh, and then... The final evolution, Blue Ocean evolution of movies, is the Megaplex. Now, the Megaplex is the idea of having up to almost 20 screens. So you can show every movie that's out, just about every movie that's out at the same time. And what helps with this is now you're in, in improving the profitability and the offerings of the movie theater by having all these different screens and being able to manage them, but also enhancements like stadium seating, reclining seats. Uh, selecting your seats when you're buying your tickets online or at the theater, enhanced food options, restaurants, bars, pizza restaurants, arcades, um, besides the typical soda, candy, and popcorn, really expanded food selection. Uh, some theaters even have waitress and waiting service. So the Megaplex was really, you know, the final evolution of movie theaters where the multiplex, now be in mind if I go back a step, the multiplex, in some cases, that was taking the old palace theaters and making them into two or three screens. So that was sort of not everything. They thought the two or three screens would be enough. And then four and five screens evolved, and finally the megaplex is when they get up to, say, 15 or greater screens. So the multiplex is really a reorganization of a lot of the palace or the traditional one-screen theaters and carving them up, taking the balcony as a separate theater, splitting the theater splitting the audience downstairs into two other theaters and typically making a, tri a, a triplex or three screens, which was can be considered a multiplex. And the megaplex is really the one location for all the screens and the enhancement of the audience experience. So what the megaplex does is they have to compete with high definition TVs uh, and on-demand video. So what the megaplex does is create an opportunity to see it on a bigger screen with better sound, with digital projection, with 3D projection, with IMAX projection, reclining seats, uh, and enhanced food uh, selection and experience, making it more of a night out and getting away from your living room and really experiencing something truly different than you can get at home. And that's the blue ocean uh, strategies of the movie theater industry is trying to keep a step ahead of um, people's tastes and people's, um, what people need. So uh, as television and home entertainment and home box, or, um, and HBO as you know it, uh, was developed and brought more entertainment into the hands of people at home, movie theaters had to create new blue ocean opportunities to keep people coming back to the movies. And the Megaplex was their final 
not their final, their current Blue Ocean evolution to keep you um, interested and looking forward to going to the movies. Uh, the, at the same time, the movie industry has been developing movies that are more event movies. Starting all the way back in the 70s with Star Wars and Jaws, creating the first blockbusters. So today, a lot of the movies that are released um, are released with a great amount of anticipation. Films that have either a past franchise or a past following, like comic book movies, that touch a great amount of people in a way that they, they, you can't wait to see them. And it makes enhances the experience to see them in 3D, to see them on a large screen, really creating an environment for people to want to go to the movies. Um, and that is just a little history of the blue ocean in the movie theater industry. Okay, so that's it for my um, lectures on the blue ocean. I hope that helps you understand how the blue ocean is different than the red ocean and how competing with the mindset of a blue ocean can help companies really eclipse and leapfrog the competition and create a, a product that consumers didn't even know they wanted or needed, but once they see it, they can easily recognize the value. The value creation is easily communicated so people really see that, you know what? Uh, I, I could have paid $300 for uh, a PC laptop, but I'm willing to pay $1,000 for a MacBook because I see all the extra value and innovation it includes. And, I, and, I'm, and you know, that's, they're communicating it to me in a way where I see it's valuable and, I, and I, I'm willing to spend the extra money because the value is there. Okay, so thank you and... Till next time.